Welcome to the Human Power Podcast, presented by Human Eye Solutions and XMA. This is the place where resilience meets personal growth. I'm Scott Ward. And I'm Serena Kirsten. Each episode, we uncover the stories of individuals who have faced life's hurdles head on, buck the trend of social trends and emerge stronger. We're here to inspire, teach and unlock the secrets to unleashing your potential together. So let's get ready to dive deep into conversations that illuminate the power of resilience of the human spirit. Let's embark on this journey together. So today we're joined by Luton Town FC manager, Rob Edwards. Welcome to the Human Power Podcast, Rob. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to having this little discussion now. And we're very much looking forward to obviously delving a little bit deeper into some of the experiences that you've had along your journey, Rob. And just for a second before we get to that, we're going to talk a little bit about you. So your narrative is not just a tale of football management, but a testament to the power of resilience, strategic foresight and the relentless pursuit of human excellence. Your journey with Luton Town continues to inspire, demonstrating the impact of dedicated leadership in the challenging world of football in humanising the techniques of player management and a people first policy, which is pretty groundbreaking. You led Forest Green Rovers to promotion as League Two champions in the 2021-22 season. And then obviously you went on to manage Watford for a brief period before joining Luton Town. And you're giggling at me as I say that. Is it the word brief? It always brings a wry smile to my face. Knowing the person you are though, Rob, you'll understate your playing career. But it wasn't bad, was it? (laughs) There's some good clubs in there, but I don't think um, think there was any loads of great performances in there. I'm really proud of of what I did and uh, what I was able to achieve and be part of. When you want to be a football player, you know, it's all you think about, it's all you dream about doing and play in the Premier League. And it was only a couple of times for Blackpool, where you see eight times for Villa, so 10 times, but it was special for me. I wanted more and, and I hope now that I can try and, you know, have more success now in, in, in this part of my life. But uh, yeah, some special memories, met loads of special people along the way. That's almost better. You remember those times, you remember the good times, you remember good people. And, um, and football certainly gives you that along the way. As an ex-athlete, it's what you look back on and smile, right? It's those memories that you often forget or you compartmentalise and then they come to the front and it, it makes, you, makes you laugh to yourself. But today I want to start with something that would have really pushed you mentally, physically, emotionally as a, as a human being, knowing the person you are. You've just been sacked by Watford after four months, right? So what emotions, responses and thoughts are going through your mind? Because no doubt it would have been fairly lonely. Yeah, it's, it, it is. And this, this job can be lonely through good times as well. You know, it's difficult to, to explain that. Um, yeah, it was difficult. I mean, it was a challenging time that th- those few months were challenging anyway, which won't come as a surprise to many people listening that know um, Watford as a club. I'd been told about some of the challenges that I may, may face when I go in, but it was, I went in with probably some ego and backed myself and believed that you know, we could achieve something along with, with Richie, my assistant, and we believed that we could be successful. And we, we really, we didn't really get a chance to be successful or to fail. We'd had 10 league games. We'd lost two of them. You know, we didn't win it. We won three, drew five. It was, we were a point off the playoffs and it was just, it was just getting started really. So what did I feel? I felt anger, embarrassment, relief. I mean, I'd heard it, you know, the, the chairman sort of let me know. And then eight minutes later, it was out on Sky Sports News and it's out there. So I wanted to try and let the kids know because yeah. they were going to be hearing it in school. And um, so it was just get a message to them. Listen, I'm fine. Don't worry, but you're going to see this now. And a, a huge mixture of emotions. But there was some relief there as well because it, it wasn't the most enjoyable period. It was a, it was, um, it was um, an experience, but I wouldn't say a great experience. But but I can, you know, I did learn a lot from it and I can lean on some of those experiences now as well. And I'm sure I will do going forward when, when I go through other difficult times. Yeah, and I think it's just as important, isn't it? I think in sport, you you learn the good, but you also learn what's not so good. And, and those lessons can be actually more valuable and sometimes in the times when you are more successful, obviously, because you really start to understand the identity, the culture, who you want to be in terms of in those environments. So totally get that, I think. Something that um, our listeners will be curious to hear about is uh, your adaptability within those times. So, you know, how have the challenges that you faced during your playing career, going back a little bit, and since shaped your approach to management and decision making? Mm. When we go back to the start, I got injured at Aston Villa, uh, at Goodison Park, I just got into the team, just made my debut for Wales. Things were going really well and I was playing well, I was confident and um, just turned 20 years of age and um, hurt my ankle quite badly. And that was my last ever game for Villa. It was toward, that was around sort of March, April time. So the season was done. 
Um, started the preseason. I was with the first team, and but my ankle wasn't right. It wasn't right. It was still big. It was swollen. It was angry, and I couldn't turn the same way. I couldn't move the same way. I couldn't strike the ball the same way. So it was difficult. Didn't play for Villa. Went on a couple of loans to Crystal Palace and to Derby. So I played some football in the Championship that year, but I was playing in pain. Spoke to the manager David O'Leary, and it was clear then I was wasn't really going to be in his plans, and had to move on. Moved football clubs. And um, yeah, quite a bit going on. So some real highs and then, and then some tough times. That sort of started off and I never felt the same. I'll be honest, I still, my ankle still doesn't hurt. It doesn't feel the same. So really then I sort of clung on to, for the rest of my career. I've got to be honest, I had 10 years of just clinging on and, and hanging in there. I think then, you know, the ankle almost turned, that turned into knee, chondral defect in my knee. Then that came up to my hip. And by the time I was 30, I, I, I'd kind of had enough. But in, in, within that 10 year period, I had moments where it was good, you know, I'd, played a decent amount of games at Wolves and a part of a promotion at Blackpool and like you said I wore the armband for a spell there and, and I did at Barnsley and part of a promotion at Norwich you know so I kind of experienced lots of different roles within the teams so I think what that sort of helped me you know in this role now is just to have empathy it doesn't mean I know what people are thinking but sometimes I have a decent idea of it you know if someone's not starting or some you know I, I need to have that chat with him if someone's injured, I need to make sure I get my arm around him and just tell him that I'm with him. And if there's anything you need, the door's always open. It's helped me because I know it can be tough and it can be lonely when you're injured or not in a team or whatever, uh, or not playing well. <laughs> I had plenty of those moments as well. So empathy is a, is a big one in the role that I'm in now. And because I've lived through lots of different experiences, lots of lows as well as some highs, um, it's probably stood me in good stead doing this. It just sounds like you've never, you haven't necessarily ever taken anything for granted in terms of the experiences that you've had in a sport like football, which we all know is pretty brutal. Um, it's fast paced and results are pretty much the bottom line. To have someone like yourself with that outlook on it, even under pressure, is I think something all our listeners can take. Whether you're a, if you're a CEO or you're leading your own business. Pressure is pressure, right? It is. I think what, what I've got to stress as well is I was really lucky. I mean, I'm, I've, got, I've got an amazing wife. I've got three brilliant children. We had children pretty young. I never felt like I've been in really dark places with injuries or if I've been out of the team. I was, always be able to, I was always able to come home and then park that a little bit and then play with the kids or, you know, and, and realise that there's more important things here as well. And I was really lucky. I know not everyone's got that either. Yeah, I think it's, if you look at it in a, in a non-sporting context, I think it's relatable to the world of post-COVID. I think it allowed everyone to really re-examine what their personal success is or what their personal happiness needed to look and feel like. Mm. When you're in that elite sports world, you're, you're told there is a uniqueness of what you're going through. And so naturally it can create a detachment of reality of what's important. What does it really need to look and feel like? And you're told if you lose a game... You should be in tears. It should really, really matter to you. But as you said, Rob, the reality is it's a game of football and there's always tomorrow. We, uh, we were 3-0 up at Bournemouth the other week yeah. and lost 4-3. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <laughs> that was tough. And then we're, we're, we're in the hotel and everyone's getting back and, and the room was like a morgue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know what it's like, you know, after you've, after you've lost the game, especially in that fashion. It's not yeah. happened often. Yeah. Being 3-0 yeah. up at half time and losing 4-3, it was it's pretty wacky. But we did it. And... Um, yeah, it was silence. And I just said, I, I felt I needed to say something. So I gathered everyone together and I, I, and I sort of, it was, it was along the lines of, look, and I, we were playing that game because it was, it was replay because Tom Lockyer had that cardiac arrest in the, in the first game. So I said, look, the last time we were here, it literally was life and death. I said, like, no one's, no one's died, thank goodness. You know, this game, we've lost a game of football. Now we've lost it in a way that's really painful now, but we've lost, ultimately we've lost a game of football. I said, look, I played for managers that if, this would have happened. They'd rant and rave and throw stuff and go mental. And, and I said, I'll be honest, lads, I need you to want to run for me. So I can lose people now, you know, and I'm not going to. We're going we're gonna to love you. And we're going to, we'll be really honest. So we're going to review it and we can have honest meetings tomorrow and go through it where we've got to learn and we've got to get better. But what good now is going mental. And it's important to us. And we know football means a hell of a lot to, to loads of people around the country. So I'm not trying to belittle that. But last time we were there, I'll never forget that what we were going through with locks and that situation. And it's just, it's just, it always, I always try and bring it back to lads. What's the worst that can happen today? We can lose. Obviously the story that you've had to go through as a football club is close to me. I'm hoping it, it can act as a good lever of real self-reflection for people to actually, it's, it's unfortunate we lost the other night. 
probably could have won, should have won, but we didn't. Let's just step forward together. Let's hold hands and keep moving forward. I, I find it, I, I just find it fascinating how you talk about how you do things because it is not easy to do it the way that you're doing it. It's very easy just to get angry and not have that self-regulation and to go in, in team environments and upset the group dynamic with emotion. One of the quotes I quite enjoyed from a Sky uh, News interview with you is that you feel like you forged a coalition of defiance with your players. You feel very much in the trenches with your boys, which I just think, you know, if I was an athlete playing for you, I'd want to be there by your side. I would want to run for you because you're right there. You're not you're not leading from the top. You're right there with them every step of the I way. I think that's so important because I think, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about what sort of utopia would be, but if we've got a, a group of people here who want to fight for each other and run for each other, I think that beats a team that's just well organized and tactically aware. There's times where I will lose it, you know, and there's time, but it doesn't happen often, but there's times where they need to see that emotion as well. And it's trying to know when the right time is to sort of go bang, like, you know, like it's, the skip might get kicked or hit or something or it may jump. Yeah. <laughs> something, but just you're catching like... that attention and going, sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's just having, it's, it's knowing when and when you're going to have that effect if you're shouting all the time it's white noise and it's, there's no point but they'll know when i'm not happy and when and, and I, hopefully i can have that effect as well if i need to to raise my voice or have an impact in that way but you can be passionate and, and demand of people but um try and have some clarity as well i think is, is really important rather than just shouting and going nuts i never forget i had um coffee with sean dyish about four years ago um and i played with sean at luton and We've paid for some some managers who aren't afraid of using quite a few words that you would never repeat in front of your children. And and he said to me, Scotty, he said, I never use specific words in front of players. He said, because if I'm asking them to be on board with what I want to be on, we've got to be respectful to one another. You think about leadership traits, Serena, and we're talking, if we work with an organisation, for example, from an LND perspective, the phrase is exactly one that you've used, Rob, which is coalition of change. If we're gonna if we're gonna instruct a transformation within a company, if we're going to create a real enabled team where people can go on that journey of self-discovery, you've got to want to do it for one another. And I think often we look for the fast answer, and especially in sport, right, it's the quick win, isn't it? Because we, we live on that fast cycle of instant gratification, quick wins. There's always tomorrow, the saying, don't worry about today, there's always Tuesday. But what that actually does is shorten the cognitive function of the brain. So unless you're actually giving long-termism to your players, and actually saying, don't worry, you're part of this journey. We can't expect them to keep wanting to do the same week in, week out, especially like for you where you've got a smaller squad. And actually, the players are constantly playing in red. Very, very few times are they in green. They're always in red. But you know what? They'll keep doing it because they're together. You're a perfect example, the epitome of, we're up against it. But you know what? We're going to give it a bloody good go. I have a question about success. But for me, for this year, Luton Town, don't get me wrong, from a business perspective, you want to stay up. But for me, for Luton Town, I don't think that represents success. I think what you've already done is success. I think you've, don't forget you had people at the start of the season saying you won't even get a point. And we know we were written off and um, we still will be, but I do, I do think we've obviously changed a lot of people's opinions yeah. on, on us, not not saying that we're not going to go down, but I just think, oh, well, I see what you're about now. It's, it's, it's strange, isn't it? You can, like we did, we finished third in the league last year and won the playoffs. Now we go, wow, what a great job Luton have done, brilliant. And then all of a sudden you're in the Premier League and now we're getting judged yeah. by Premier League standards. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. I understand we'll be favourites to go down, playoffs, small club, first time in the league, all of that sort of stuff. It's fine. No problem. Um, but I think, yeah, we've been able to to build and grow into it and maybe change one or two people's minds and, and maybe a few people actually appreciate what we're trying to do as well now. Can you share any instances with, with our listeners where fostering the team culture and the, you know, the strong team culture that you do have um, over in Luton has directly contributed to any of these challenges that you as a club has faced either on or off the pitch? The most obvious one, and I know I've already mentioned it, was obviously when we had the, the Tom's, Tom's incident at, um, at Bournemouth. It's the, uh, the most difficult moment I've had in a, in a football match or, or, or really ever in, in my life, really. I, not have to see or be around someone and having a cardiac arrest. And, um, and first of all, the medical guys were incredible and saved his life. And it was amazing to go back last week and see them and, and give them a hug and say, thank you. And I know it was important for Tom as well, but then quite quickly. So this all happened. It was great that relatively quickly then he was sitting up and in hospital and alive. 
to, 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 to see him in the evening, that was important for me, I think. But then I needed a few days and the plan was always to have a couple of days off after that game. Anyway, we stuck to that plan. We didn't, didn't know if that was the right thing or what, but, um, we had a couple of days off and I needed to try and get my head together. And I was in a bit of a strange place and, um, because I, I, I've, I'm picking a team. And I, you know, you feel responsible for everyone that's out there, and um, and I love, and especially him, he's my captain. I love him, and for what he's done for me and for for this football club, I, I do. I, I love the man. He's a, he's an incredible person, and uh, it was it was difficult to see him suffering like that. And um, so I needed a little bit of time, and, and and everyone was brilliant, really supportive. And we had sporting chance that got in touch, and 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 loads of people, loads of people. Uh, Gary, uh, my CEO, sort of allowed me to have a have a day or so and spoke to him a couple of days later and he said, right, we, we're going to need you now, little Rob, as well. We're getting, you know, the lads and everyone, the staff are going to need you as well. So that's a sort of click into gear and and then um, and talk, and think, right, how am I going to, how are we going to handle this now? We've got Newcastle United in a Premier League game coming up in a few days. Like, what, what do we do? Um, so I think it was important... Um, Spoke to quite a few people. It was important now that we, I, I, what I didn't want to do, I didn't want to say, right, let's just, let's do it for locks. That, we, that, that's going to be, that's obvious. We, we want, and, and Tom would want us to do it, f but not for him. We just, we just wants us to do it anyway, regardless, and win a game of football and continue on. Um, but it was important when I was in the media and in the press, I didn't want to, I didn't want to come across selfish and I didn't want it to come across, oh, well, let's use this. It was really important to me. I didn't want to, but what I did want to try and do is embody what he is, mm. and try and use that mm. to help us, because he's he's someone that's dragged himself from non-league football to performing at a really high standard in the Premier League, scoring a goal at Everton, you know, captaining his team in the Premier League. I mean, it's inspirational his journey. So I wanted to embody that. So we had a meeting uh, when we when we came back in. We we. And I, I I had to sort of speak and um, I, I I talked about locks. I talked about him, what he means to me, and um, got emotional again and sort of broke down really in front of the players. But 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 said that I want us to, I want this to be us going forward, and um, and what he is and what he means to us as a as a group, and um, it was important to do that. And I almost say look he's okay first and foremost that was the most important thing and then let's talk about him I want to talk about him and I want to talk about how we're going to try and body Tom now going forward and not in a selfish way but it was it was going to bring us closer together as a group and this group is already tight anyway to be part of successful things and a, and, and a playoff win a, a season where you've been successful and a playoff win that success um you're already going to be tight. You're always going to, you're going to be together. And, and, um, but this was something else and it was something different that I think really united us in the group even more. So a really challenging situation, not that something that you learn on the coaching badges when you're doing it, you know, and, and by the way, this is stuff that you know, all of the staff, I needed the staff. I, I needed my staff that day. You know, I was gone. I couldn't come out in front of the cameras that, that day. I couldn't have gone out there and, played the other the rest of the 30 minutes that we needed to i need i needed my staff then i i i'd gone and i said that openly so i don't know how to lead you now lads in the dressing room immediately after that event so i needed a bit of time i had to think about it but we wanted to try and embody tom and um and allow that to galvanize us and try and um drive us forward even more um so that was probably the the best way and the players responded really well and Everyone dealt with it differently and people are still probably processing it even now. Going back to Bournemouth was a bit of a challenge as well the other day and to, to the scene of the event. But um, yeah, that's probably the biggest one because it's probably one that most people won't have to deal with, you know, especially in a sporting sense very often. So um, yeah, yeah, a, a challenging one, but one where I think we've really, yeah, brought everyone closer and united even tighter as a group. Yeah, and I think it's fascinating actually hearing you talk about that for me because it could be quite easy in the, you know tough times for things to really fragment and for people to go back to their safe place, whether it's home, whether it's a couple of 
key people in their team that they get on with better than others, you know, and things like that. So the fact that actually we're able to use that to unite, I think is a really useful um, tool in terms of some of our listeners, you know, wanting to, if you if they are going through a tough time thinking about how they can actually use the bad in order to turn it into something really powerful um, in terms of moving forward. Um, I just want to move on now to kind of our next segment and we're starting to look at um, resilience recipes. So this next part is all about you and your resilience recipe. So examining secret strategies, lessons or advice that has essentially helped you through some of your most difficult times as a player or a coach. So really just love to hear any tips, tricks, tools, things that you do that our listeners could potentially try and implement into their own lives. And you're giggling at me again. Don't. <laughs> this might come up, take it as you think. Don't think you're so special. And that's something that Kenny Jacket said to me once. <laughs> so um, we, we all got sacked at Wolves uh, when I was um, part of um, Paul Lambert's staff. Um, I was manager of AFC Telford United for, for, a, for a season, it turned out. And I, um, I really wanted the, 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 that job. I, I wanted to lead again. I wanted to, to have a go. But it was, in a, it was in a league that I didn't know anything about. I didn't know... Um, I didn't know the players when I was going in and there was, there was just lots and lots to learn. And, and it, we started okay, cutting a long story short, started okay, really difficult middle. And then, and then we sort of got it together again towards the end. But during this middle period here, we had games called off, the weather was bad. There was, we had a run where we didn't win in six games and we're in the bottom three. And when there's a thousand people there, it's almost worse than if yeah. there's 20,000 yeah. people there. You can hear the individuals, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I'm like... And I'm someone, I, I know, I like to be liked. I do, I just, I, I do. And I don't want to, I don't like the negativity and I can hear people aren't happy and I can hear these individual voices. And so I remember speaking to Kenny um, about it and he said, what makes you so special? And I went, what, what do you mean? He said, well, we all go through it. We all get it. It just comes with the job. Just deal with it, you know? And from then I've always just thought, that, like people care, Rob, so leave that. Don't worry about it. Concentrate on what I can focus on and what I can control. I'm not any more special than anyone else. Why can't, why can't someone have, have a go at me? That's the th first thing that I just, I've taken that with me then to Forest Green and then to, to Watford and then to Luton. So you can't keep everyone happy all the time, unfortunately. And that goes for my players. That goes for the supporters. I'll try because I'm, I'm that kind of person and I want everyone to be happy, but it, we're not in a perfect world where everyone's going to be happy all the time. So I know I'm not that special and I've got to be able to just shut that out and try and concentrate on my job. And that was a real good lesson that Kenny taught me quite early on in my sort of managerial career, if you like. Even the best at times will get questioned the best. And I'm always thinking, right, well, if they're going to get it at times and maybe not by many people, but they will, then I certainly can. If we take it out of sport for now, for, for those listening that, again, aren't in that livelihood of, of either played or being part of that sports space. What realistic mechanisms or approaches, Rob, can you, can you offer someone that can help them to build and or sustain their own personal resilience? As I said, we're, we're coming out as post-COVID where a lot of people have been through a lot of trauma, which means we don't have the mechanisms to facilitate them. So for everything you've gone through, what's a useful tip or trick just to allow you as an individual to sustain your own well-being, happiness, whilst you are combative with those inevitable yeah, ups and downs. I, I'm the kind of person, I, I, I'm a people person. I have to speak. Mm. I have to try and talk to people and maybe dump it yeah. on people. So if I'm going through difficult moments, doubts, worries, um, I have to try and speak to people. So I've got, um, I've got, and this, uh, yeah, this can be obviously in football or away from it, I have, but I've got mentors that I will speak to that may have lived through some of these experiences that I can, vent or, or or ask questions and and there's a good chance they'll have been through quite a lot of it some of the guys i'll speak to have done thousands and thousands of games so there's a good chance they'll have been through it at some stage and they can relate to it my best thing is my family and be around them and try and take my mind away from some of the difficulties that i might be going through or stresses or strains or talk to talk to mentors and talk to people that may have lived through certain experiences you know you've been faced with things that would never have been expected when you started this season but talking has allowed you to process and facilitate the unknown and i think that that is something that often in families 
in friendship circles, in workplaces, isn't necessarily encouraged, but can actually be the answer. You can be vulnerable, you show vulnerability Correct, yeah, as well, yeah. right? And I think, I, I mentioned it before, I needed, I needed my staff around me, I needed my CEO to say, right, we're all here with you, but we're going to need you as well. And I, I always say it to, to, to the lads, to the staff, you know, I'm a human being, I don't know it all, I'm going to make loads of mistakes and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, and leaning on people and asking questions, I don't like people in leadership positions that are going to be listening to this as well. You don't have to know everything. You can't. And, and, and then it, it sort of almost brings it back to, all right, what do you believe in again? And then, and then it brings it back. Oh, right. Okay. I know I've got this, I've got a focus. I know what, I know what I think is right. And I know what I believe in and I know what, let's focus on that again and come back to our values and let's, let's go. And, and in the end, you sort of <laughs> muddle your way through and find, and find what, what works. So for the next part, we want to look at unlocking human potential. And obviously as a, as a manager, that's what really what your job is about, right? It's, it's tactical, but it's obviously also personal. And so was there a moment or something again, that you've endured that you haven't shared publicly that really actually triggered this need? I would say it's a thirst from you not to be liked, but to do good for people. I don't know when it was, it was, it was cause I was a real competitive lad and like had to win everything. And I was loud and I was, I, I know I wouldn't have been liked by everyone. I didn't care then. I'm talking like as a 12, 13 year old, 14 year old. Didn't care, just wanted to win. Just wanted to be competitive. You, you'd hear me, you'd hear me first and then you'd see me, do you know what I mean? And it, that's how I was. And and then I got selected to go to the national school. Yeah. You know, Lillisha. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden then I'm not the best. Yeah. I'm living with like Jermaine Defoe, he's like, or Joe Cole, and you know, he's the best, and uh, he's the best, and, and they're all like, he's better than me, and he's better than me, and he's better than me. And there's like 31 people better than me, do you know what I mean? And there's this little skinny lad from Shropshire who's like with these inner city kids who are, you know, better than me, quicker, stronger, better technically, just like, whoa. And it knocked me down, it probably knocked my confidence and everything as well. And I became a different person then, but I was part of my journey and growing up. But it was, yeah, it was difficult. And I wanted then to, you know, you worked out because someone would tell you, don't, don't be an idiot. Yeah. I, you know, what are you saying that for? And you see a look and it, I started to build my senses around me and working out when I'm walking in a room, like, is he having me or not? Or is like, it, it just heightened my senses. And that's where it came from. I know it did. You know, I just, I sort of changed. You know, I, was, I knew it wasn't liked by everyone then and it kind of bothered me and it, I started to want to be. So then I, maybe please people or be something different just to try and fit in and, you know, sort of make life a little bit easier in those couple of years. And, um, yeah, that, that's where all that sort of bit that came from. So I, I used to feel fear players are better when they're braver and they feel like they can make mistakes. We talk about, you can make mistakes. It's no problem. It's just we're human beings. We're going to, as long as we react the right way, as long as we learn from them, then I think then we make less mistakes. And if we make mistakes, all right, learn from it. Doesn't mean we're gonna, you know, we want more. But if you don't, if you, if you're afraid to make them, you ain't gonna perform your best. I just know you're not because I was afraid, and I and I wasn't able to perform my best ever, a whole career, and that that fills me with regret. And I think that's a sign of a leader, right? We've all played for managers where you know that if you mess up straight away, they look at the bench, they look at what the response is because fear is driving their output. And so for your players to be in such a comfortable state where they know that they can make a mistake, but it's about what your reaction is, I think is a, shoe, a, a sure sign of empowerment. It's just something to be instinctively proud about as an individual and something you should be because we often see it in, in major organisations that we're working with. You feel the fear when you step in the building um, and there's a blame culture. We can't, we can't expect you to instill trust in other people unless you really understand yourself and most importantly, your personal value. If you don't know that, you don't know where you need help, and if you don't know need, if you don't know where you need help, you can't ask for it. Um, so I think often in sport, in life, we're looking in the wrong places because it naturally inhibits vulnerability, and it's something we're often not taught to embrace. But for me, it's the only way of of living. Um, like you say, when you're faced with severely traumatic episodes, you understand what value means, and it's in those moments that you can then step forward and actually say, right. We're going to do something special here for us. And that's what I feel we get. And hopefully our listeners today 
can really feel from you and sharing your stories that you've not shared before as well. You've got a beautiful voice, haven't you, Scott? Thank you. you talk. You really have, you know. I mean, when it's my, I hear my gravelly voice talking now. Hey, I'm just voice, trying to... Today, like getting after the lads and, and you've got such a beautiful voice. I, I'm just trying now. to match all you of the that. quotes that I keep getting lately on Sky Sports about the best looking manager in the Premier League. So, uh, is that what you're getting, is yeah, it? Yeah, that's, that's the, <laughs> new, the new label. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Hey, Kessa, come, mate. You won't be beautiful forever. <laughs> <laughs> so something, Rob, I just want to uh, touch on a little bit is that you, you've spoken so much around this element of vulnerability and you actually you lead from the front with that, which, you know, a lot of the business leaders that we work with, we come across, they find it really hard to open themselves up to the the thought of vulnerability it actually strikes a lot of fear a lot of a lot of leaders think that it's potentially weak um to to kind of show this to employees and followers so just really curious around and what are you what else are you doing in that space that our listeners can try and take into their own environments i actually did a talk um the other night a, a, a webinar and it was about it was loads of coaches that are working in the national league at the moment i sort of spoke openly about what i do and if I, would my, if, I, if I meet a new player or a new group, a new team, and what I speak about first, almost that first meeting, so I almost sort of tee up or talk about it openly then. I, I say, I, I, it's literally that, I don't know it all. I'm not going to stand here and think I'm the best. I'm not at all. And we're going to work this out together. So first of all, I, say, I don't know it all. Hopefully I know enough to try and help at certain moments, but that's first thing. But also talk about like what you're going to get from us first me and the staff rather than straight away saying what i want from you so we'll talk about honesty respect and time you'll get our time we've all had a different journey to get to this moment so we'll treat you all with respect not everyone wants a hug in the morning not everyone wants a high five in the morning or a handshake a hello might be enough whatever i've got to try and work that out honesty you know you know you know if you're not in a team, you know why you're not in a team, what you got to do to get in a team and why he's playing or whatever. So, you know, we can talk about that a bit more. And time, whether that's a coffee, if it's a chat, if it's extra work on the grass, if it's analysis work, whatever it might be, a phone conversation, voice note, whatever it be, you'll get our time. So I talk all about all those sorts of things, but then it's all well and good talking about it. you got to live it. I was, I was coaching a Forest Green and it was... Um, speaking to one of the opposition managers before the game and he was saying, yeah, I want players to be brave and, you know, I'm going to allow them to play with freedom and express themselves. And then literally the game started and he was going nuts and just berating them and throwing his bottle. And I thought, okay, yeah, you know, you got to probably do what you say you're going to do and because the players will just spot that and work, they'll work it out. So I think by talking about those things and saying it it makes us live it as well you got to listen to yourself you got to hear what you're saying you can't say one thing and then do something else i think because otherwise for us football players or for other people leaders their their, their, their colleagues their their staff they'll work that out they'll see it they'll smell it a mile off i don't believe in what he sh says or she says because it's not genuine you've got to be you've got to be genuine and um authentic with what you're saying and then you got to you got to live it i think time's the interesting one there because Serena will back me up on this one. Often when you speak to leaders, you say, what's your biggest challenge? And they'll say time. But I think that's something we often, we often develop with leadership teams is allowing the space to be consistent. It doesn't always have to be flooded with information, but just make sure there's value in the co communication or correspondence you share. And most importantly, there's a, there's a human element to the, to the narrative that you send out to your teams. A quick email is great, but that's down to interpretation. A hello in the morning is probably far more valuable. I, I always get around and, and see everyone in the morning and, um, and try and be visible. Mm. You know, I think it's important. I'm, I always say the office door is always open. If it's not open, just knock and come in. Do you know what I mean? So it's always there. And th that is the case. It's very rare. The lads need to come up because I'm always knocking about. But when I was doing my, my pro license, yeah, um, one of the tasks was to follow a leader for the, for the day. So I went actually, I went into a school to go to, to follow a headmaster, a head teacher. He was a guy who um, who goes into schools that may be struggling and failing a little bit, and then goes in and, and turns them around. He's done it at a number number of different places, and he was fascinating. And I went in and, and followed him, and um, he goes round every morning. Every one of his teachers, so every room, every class, it was a big school, and just says, "I don't have to shake their hand, I don't have to, but just to say good morning, just look in the whites of their eyes, and that will tell me are they all right? Do I need to go and see them?" 
after then they needed a bit more time or something from me and that just stayed with me so it's just something that I've always make sure I do and just make sure I say good morning and make sure I'm around there and, and visible um because when you're in this position I think it's important to be seen I really uh, I really love what you what you're talking about around this this presence visibility the sense that you're really owning the environment because at the end of the day as, as the leader of the club you you know the buck stops with you essentially so I really um value that insight and I think our leaders especially our, our listeners who are leaders in corporate environments and um, the importance of being visible um, and that role modeling piece and get, getting your people to actually understand a little bit about who you are because <laughs> you can't expect people to follow someone that they don't know right especially in football um, because as you say it's week in week out and you're, and you're kind of you know going into battle pretty much every every day to make sure that you're staying in the league staying up you know that's getting it, promotion. It's about is the, the, the match at the end of the week is obviously the important bit because that's for the points but then the stuff the day to day is the biggest thing and making sure that I know that Jordan Clark's missus is you know is okay because she's and she's you know they're due to have their baby next week this, you know the next, and, and like just knowing what's going on and he's going to have to have a, the first day off before Tottenham because that's more important than preparing for Tottenham the, the, birth, of his, the birth of his child so Little things like that, not little things, they're big things, but just those bits, again, that brings us closer together because it has to be, for us anyway, it's a family first um, policy. It just has to be that way. Everyone's as vulnerable as a person next to them. It just depends on whether there's a forum of sharing, right? And and I think football's difficult because you you have to become an adult at the age of 16, which is impossible. And I liken it to being a senior leader in in a, in a business where... They might be managing a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people, and they feel like they can't demonstrate vulnerability because it will provide a disconnect. Scott, it's not meant to be fluffy, either. Do you know what I mean? No, but I that's, that's not what this it. is. And I know, and I know you know that as well. And yeah. Like I said before, I have, I have to have honest conversations with people all the time. I have to leave people out, and all they want to do is play. You know, I'm taking money off them. I've got to say, you're not playing. This is why those this is hard every week. I've got to do it. I'm letting people down. I'm letting more people down. Not at the moment with all the injuries we've got. <laughs> Normally, I'm letting more people down than I've got that are really, you know, having me on a, on a weekly basis. You know, I've got to have 15 people that are disappointed. And I've got to do that every week and let people down constantly. But I think if you can do it with honesty and respectfully, then they can understand. They don't have to agree with it. But Rob, I think that's what you providing that level of connection removes the opportunity for interpretation. And so when you remove the ability of interpretation, it, it removes doubt. And it means it becomes a, a personal thing to a professional thing, which allows you to move forward with them behind you saying, okay, I'm not playing. I'm annoyed. I'm not getting my appearance bonus today, but you know what? I hope we win. And I think in years gone by, we both know, all of us know here that that hasn't always been the case. And that's what I'm trying to get to is by, by retaining that level of connection and that consistency and that continuity of voice, you're taking guesswork out of the equation. Now we're getting to the, business end of the season and it's all on the line for us we conceded a late goal against Villa the other week where you know it was the 89th minute we played so well yeah. we got back to 2-2 against a brilliant team like Villa and we dominated the second half really we played really well so proud of the players but we conceded in the 89th minute to lose the game and I kicked the I kicked the the water bucket you know with all the water bottles in and I think a few people have seen it because it was the games on Sky it's the first time I've really shown sort of like real frustration on the touchline. So I completely get your point. That was when the emotion took over and all that stuff with me saying, I'm going to be calm and try and back the players there. And that moment, uh, gone. Uh, and after the game as well, it was a vent. And then, it was right, and then I had to try and say, right, I can't say anything productive here now. I've got to go. Yeah, enough, I've got to yeah, get out. Yeah. And then we can revisit it now on Monday or whenever it was the next time. So yeah, there's emotion there. It's really difficult sometimes. And especially now at this stage for me, People will be watching now going, let's see if you can live by it now, you know, in the next few weeks because when it's really on the line, yeah. Before we wrap up, Serena and I want to ask you probably the most difficult question of your week. Um, after everything you've faced, public scrutiny and the recent plaudits, what's your human power? It's a really good question. I think for me, it, it is empathy. I think by trying to have an understanding of how people are, are feeling, I think is just so, so important in this role, this job that we're doing. So, because I've lived through quite a lot of what what our players and our, even our staff have gone through, I can try and tap into that experience and try and help if I can. I think that is probably my biggest skill. 
Rob, thanks again um, for sharing some of those insights. Really, really interested in terms of, you know, what you've been through, but most importantly, how you're turning what you've been through as a player into something really, truly special as a as a coach and a manager. So we wish you the best of luck um, for the rest of the season. I think something that's really stood out for me today is this um, using the tough times to unite, uh, particularly if you're in team environments and the importance of that vulnerability for resilience building within your team and within yourself and actually showing that as a leader and the importance of that I can really tell how important that is to you um one of my favorites to think and take home from today is not thinking you're so special <laughs> so for any listeners out there on your high horse let's get back down to earth and you know start recognizing that all you can do is just control the controllables that's all we can ever do the external environment will always remain and we can't control that say it live it do it the importance of that and taking risks to be brave. And I think those are just such key messages that anyone listening can take in to tomorrow. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thanks, Serena. Thanks, Scott. We truly hope that today's guest has offered you, our listeners, the opportunity to explore your own journey of self-reflection, personal empathy and success. Remember, it's important to share your stories of struggle and success with those around you. Let's unlock potential together. Thanks for tuning in to the Human Powered Podcast. It's been a privilege to share today's journey of resilience and empowerment with you. Remember, each story we share is a step towards understanding our own true potential. Follow Humanized Solutions on social media to become part of our growing community. And don't hesitate to share your own experiences. I'm Scott. And I'm Serena, reminding you that within each of us lies untapped strength. Let's unlock it together. Until next time, keep striving, keep believing and keep growing.